Good morning, everybody. Happy Saturday. Happy Sheila Day. How are you? Great. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. Marketing Max is uh, on vacation, thank goodness. And uh, I'm sure he's having a wonderful time. So we will see him next Saturday. So Sheila, it's me and you today. And I'm going to start down with the stats. Um, you know, we keep saying that the homes are flying off the shelf, and they really are. It's just amazing. We're down to 1.2 months of inventory, which is very scary. But hopefully after the holidays here, people will start listing their homes. I think so, because it's such a great time for sellers to sell and then buy a, a new home or upgrade their home or downsize or whatever they're going to do. But it's a great time to make a change. Don't you agree? I totally agree. With interest rates the way they are, it's it makes sense all the way around. <laughs> Only five days until 2021. And that's like the best news of the day. <laughs> It has been quite a ride here this year, but uh, it's coming to a close. And, you know, in the real estate, for real estate and for homeowners, um, this year, the homeowners gained $1 trillion in equity. And that, if you average that over all the homeowners in the United States, that's $17,000 of equity this year across the United States. That's amazing. That is. Uh, it's just amazing number. And of course, you know, um, our new homes have been performing, uh, outperforming last year. I think we sold 11,000 new homes this year. Uh, so that's that's fantastic for the builders. And I know that there's not a lot of standing inventory out there. So, yeah, it, I don't know. It couldn't be much better from our perspective in real estate. And also in our tourism, um, a lot of people are starting to come back to Vegas. So the numbers are a little better. I think we started out the year in the United States with 20 million unemployed. We're down to 10 million. So, um, and, and that helps us as well because a lot of the, we were, we went to, um, to uh, Christmas, Christmas at uh, uh, Cipriani's yesterday down at the wind. And it was, we were pleasantly surprised. You know, there was a lot of people that came to Vegas for Christmas and a lot of people were going out to eat. We had a hard time finding a reservation at a restaurant. Now, I know that there's, you know, percentage of capacity is down, but but it was just delightful. And everybody seemed to be in a good mood and spirits were high. The employees said that they've been uh, working since July and they see that the tourists are coming back more and more all the time. So I just am filled with good news today. <laughs> and then that's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> that's, that is. So, Sheila. Uh, I know you've got some great uh, information for us today, so uh, I'm just let's just get started. Um, I'm going to hide myself and put up your chart, and then I'll come back. Yeah. <clears throat> Hang on, I still didn't do it okay. right. I'm, I'm going to hide myself again. There we go. It, nope. There. Okay. Okay. We'll just, we'll go with it. Okay. Gonna, I'll get rid of the screen, sir. The, um, yeah, we'll get rid of that. There we go. We can do that. There we go. So the first thing we're going to look at is the cost of waiting. We have a couple of things for you today. So the cost of waiting, the impact that your credit score has on your on your ability to purchase a home, and then the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, if you think you can't purchase it, you can, um, if you take the right steps. So the cost of waiting is the first slide that we have up. And um, this is a slide that our awesome uh, marketing department put together with help of uh, some input from us and uh, uh, statistics basically if you waited uh if you purchased a home in 2019 versus 2020 and then 2021 now the rate examples are uh just if just that an example the mortgage amounts are realistic per what the market had been doing uh, at the time and then i'll let ruth interject and talk about that so say if you bought a home in 2019 and your rate was 3.75 
your mortgage amount would be three hundred and thirty two thousand seven fifty and your principal and interest is about thirteen twelve thirty three a month. Well, if you bought that same home in 2020, the rate um, was actually a little lower, 3.24, and the mortgage amount, 366,026. So even though your interest rate was lower, the cost of the home was higher, thus increasing your monthly payment, your principal and interest, by a uh, little more than a couple hundred dollars. So <clears throat> it makes sense to purchase your home uh, I know sometimes we think, well, let's wait. Rates are gonna, I mean, uh, cost of homes gonna go down or you hear this, that's not the case, right, yeah. Ruth? That's exactly right, that's exactly right. Yeah. yeah, so the example year over year, it's uh, $200, a little over 200 from 2019 to 2020. And then in 2021, it's about 400, a little over 400 if you waited based off of um, um, statistics, the increase in the home price. So it yeah. really makes sense. And if you look here, um, medium home price, I, I put this chart up. I mean, look at this, uh, home prices, except for, um, we had a dip there, uh, they continue to go up. And even during this pandemic, they've gone, they've increased. So at the beginning of the year, they were 300,000 and now, you know, now they're up to, to 330. So, um, and I think by the end of the year, that's gonna adjust up even higher once they do all the stats. So. Um, prices continue to increase. And if, you know, Sheila, there is a cost of waiting. Um, and I wouldn't wait uh, thinking that they're not going to even continue to go up because we're looking since 1980. And I think over the 30 year history, homes appreciate an average of 5% a year. Um, and like I just said to everybody, this past year, they increased a trillion dollars. That's a trillion dollars to the homeowner's net worth. So your home increase in value, uh, $17,000. And then when you take that across the United States, that's a trillion dollars in net worth. So mm -hmm. they continue to go up. Right, they do. And um, if you take it further, that would cost you an extra 144,000 approximately in equity over the life of the loan if you waited. Yes. every year so based off of this example here so well, makes that, sense to purchase <laughs> it really does it really does and um so in in 2020 you the chart just to interpret it uh, a little deeper you have that mortgage amount higher explain exactly why is that the cost of the housing went up it's basically it's taken a nationwide average so it's like certain areas, the interest rates are different in different, um, in California, interest rates are different than they are in Nevada versus New York. So this is an average, um, nationwide average of rates during those years. Wow, yeah. So this year, 2020, um, I think we were talking, like if you bought the medium price home here, uh, it would be a little less than 366. Mm -hmm. Um, in Vegas, and your rent would your rent would be higher than your mortgage payment. Exactly. Yeah. Right. It makes sense in more ways than one to go ahead and purchase. It is in our in our previous show last Saturday we had examples of um, uh, the cost of uh, renting versus buying, mm -hmm. and, and it really made sense. Yeah. For eighteen hundred. Yeah, eighteen hundred dollar a month rent you can purchase. Yes, and uh, oh, there's Claudia. Let's say hi to Claudia. Happy Saturday. You know, I had a hard time figuring out what day it was today. <laughs> and there's Teresa, lovely Teresa. Thank you, Teresa, for, for joining us today. Um, uh, so, oh, I was gonna say something, um, the rent, the renting. And, and rent, it's hard to find a rental. You know, and during, like Jimmy Degg always says, during tough times, you, when, if you have a rental, you have no control over whether or not, you know, that homeowner's going to be able to keep his home for whatever reason. But when you own your own home, you're in control. So not only are you paying less money, not only are you adding to your net worth, um, and, you know, you have total control and peace of mind. And that's one of the major reasons why people buy homes is the, the, it's the American dream. It's that peace of mind that, hey, I have something and it's growing and, you know, I'm getting equity 
And over 10 years, the average homeowner, their equity is 240,000. And the average renter over that same period of time, their net worth is 5,000. There's no comparison. None, none. I think it's a matter of us getting the word out. More yeah. realtors need to get the word out. <clears throat> yes. And uh, are you having a class this Saturday or this Tuesday? No, not this Tuesday. The following, um, um, it's going to be this, uh, January 5th. That cool. Tuesday. Yeah. 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 And what do you, do you know what your topic's going to be yet? Actually, by demand, we're going to talk about, um, I had people just that couldn't make to the last class. We're going to do, we're going to start off the new year with converting renters to buyers. So we're going to stick with that topic one more time for the realtors to, um, so attend the class, to, uh, Claudia and Teresa. It'd be nice <laughs> to have you there. <laughs> yeah. 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 And uh, Teresa brings up a really good point. It's, um, she's saying it's harder to get qualified for rentals right now. And I know, Teresa, uh, you do uh, a lot of rentals as well as sales. And um, it is harder. And if you can just put in the, the chat uh, why that is, what, what's the number one reason, do you think? She'll, she'll answer us in a second. It's a little okay. bit of delay. Um, and, then, and then, Teresa, just FYI, it's uh, the Tuesday, uh, January 5th at 9 a.m. at uh, the training center, 8400 West Sahara. Cool. And Claudia, you'll be there. Yes. Good. Good, good, good. Um, super. Uh, okay. So I just, I love this. And, you know, there's a lot of information here. You have to, to uh, really read deeply into this, but you don't want to miss out on the monthly payment savings and your property appreciation. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned here in the slide, the property appreciation, and I, and I glossed over it about the the home equity, but when your interest rate is lower, what that means, the impact of that is huge on your equity because more of the payment is going toward the principal, which is your equity, uh, is paying down the principal. So you're gaining equity in your home faster. And that's the beauty mm -hmm. of these low interest rates. That is correct. Absolutely. So. Would you like me to go to the next slide? Do you want to say some more things? Uh, let's, well, yeah, let's do this. So um, in, in closing on this slide, it, you really need to contact um, your realtor, Ruth, whoever you're working with right now. It's important to, to look at it. Give us a call. Um, give us a chat and we'll reach out to you to give you your options because it's that important. It could mean um, a nice retirement for you or or not. That's how important yeah. it is. So, yeah. okay. So, so Teresa is bringing up a good point here. This is the, they're making the qualifying harder and uh, many have low credit for rentals, um, but not for buying. So because the rental market right now can be selective because there are so many people moving here that want to rent the, uh, the homeowners, uh, that have these investment properties are becoming a little bit uh, stricter. If I understand what Teresa's saying, I know we can't keep rentals. I mean, we manage over 300 homes and uh, they just fly off the shelf in the first week. So, and they're good. And they, they, they're coming from other States with good uh, credit scores. So I think that there's some competition uh, going on uh, with the, uh, with the renters right now. So. I don't know. It's a great time to buy. Another reason to buy. <laughs> that is absolutely true. Okay. I am going to see if. There we go. Now it's in the middle. <laughs> okay. All right. The next slide we have is uh, the impact that your credit score has, uh, which we call a uh, FICO score. Um, the impact it has on your interest rate. It, it's, it's basically for every 20 points, you will benefit with the lower cost of the rate. So it makes sense. So let's try to work on your credit. So this is, um, so for example, if your credit score was 620 to 639, um, your APR may be 5.413, monthly payment 844, and then total interest paid is 153,665. Now check the difference out if you are at the top tier, 760 to 850. APR is 3.824 um, and your monthly payment 701. And look at the savings 
um, over fifty thousand dollars a month, and I mean over fifty thousand over the life of the loan in savings of the total interest paid, and then your monthly payment one hundred and forty over one hundred and forty dollars a month. So the credit score makes a huge difference. This is uh, our. Um, I had my credit team put this together for us, and. Um, it lets you know, and that's exactly what we do. The, the credit services, Nova Credit Services, we actually help you get your credit up either to get the, the next best interest rate or to even qualify for a, a loan uh, period. Right now, you basically need about a 620 mid credit score to purchase a home. Um, you need what? Say that again. A 620 middle credit mm -hmm. score to purchase a home. And uh, for down payment assistance, the middle credit scores are even higher. They're at 640 to 660, depending on the assistance you're looking for. Now, those are government rates there. Now, if you want um, conventional financing, the middle interest rate, you should even be higher because this is where this really comes into play right here. This is a perfect example for a conventional loan, the example of the credit scores it makes that huge of a difference in your monthly payment. And of course, the higher the mortgage, the more the monthly payment difference will be. <clears throat> so it, it makes sense. So we can help you get there. Um, I have a, few, a couple of people during the loan process. We've helped them, give them uh, provided guidance on what they should do. They've achieved it and we're able to give them a better um, interest rate by the time they closed. So it's, it's not impossible. Everything is possible if you're willing to work for it. Well, exactly. And I know um, we have a client who's working on their credit um, and uh, they're buying a million dollar home and they're putting 20% down. And um, the difference in the payment and the equity that they'll get uh, is uh, the sellers working with the, the buyer to wait until she gets her credit score up to 760 just because of what you're saying because it makes such a huge difference in in her payment especially you know when you're in that million dollar range oh absolutely absolutely yeah and one yeah. of the things one of the things that that she's doing is um, paying off a lot of her um, credit cards so that uh, they're down to uh, below 50%. And, and is there a magic percentage that it should be? Credit, you know, the, the, like if my um, credit line's 10,000, what should my highest balance be on that credit card? That's a good question, Ruth. Uh, it depends what you're trying to do. So for instance, <clears throat> um, the credit is based off of multiple things. The, the length of credit, the type of credit, and then the balances. So what you're specifically talking about is the balances that are owed to, that's one way to get your credit up. So ideally, you really wanna get it to, when you're trying to increase your credit score, 30% or less is really what you want. The balance. So, of yeah, the 30% of the high mm -hmm. limit. Mm -hmm. wow. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And then um, the types of credit, uh, what a lender looks for is a good mix. So if you have all auto loans, well, that, those are high, those are high limits and high monthly payments. So that's really not going to help your credit. So what I mean by a good mix is, is um, maybe you don't have a car loan. That's perfectly fine. You have an installment loan with um, a furniture store, or you have a um, a Visa or a Mastercard. Mastercard. Uh, those are revolving uh, credit cards, meaning you pay it down or pay it off, and then you still have a limit available that you can recharge. Um, or you have a gas card. Um, those are just a few examples of credit cards, credit types. The important thing is to keep your payments timely, keep your balances low, um, and your credit will continue to rise with time. So. Yeah, those are some things that you can do to keep it. Now, this slide also shows, let us help you get a, cre a stronger credit score or FICO score. Um, what we do with, along with a refinance or a purchase, we help you work on your credit. We provide uh, a guidance and an action plan. Now, again, we come up with it. We go ahead and give you the guidance and we will interact with you throughout the entire process. You can reach out and let us know if you have questions along the way. Um, we evaluate your credit, uh, those for the types I was just explaining. 
uh, what's, you know, what kind of credit you have. Maybe you have thin credit. If you have somebody told you in the past that your credit is thin, that just means you don't have enough for a period of time. Now, typically you want to have three trade lines for a year. I have had some people, um, uh, it used to be three trade lines for two years, but I've seen people uh, achieve the same things as long as the underwriting system gives us an approve, desktop approve, then we can move forward. Uh, it all depends. Every, every scenario is different and unique to the income, the credit, um, assets, and so on. So your situation is, is unique, and uh, we can look at it and let you know what you need to do to qualify. So, I uh, uh, was talking to, uh, I think, Adelia, and mm -hmm. uh, she works for Nova um, Credit Services, and she was saying that um, when you look at your credit, pay your pay there's some different uh strategies so if if you have a, a credit card that has a high interest rate you know you might want to pay that one uh more money on that one to get get it down so that the money you are paying isn't all going toward the interest on that credit card and there's some credit cards out there with 20 22 23 percent interest so you want to maybe get those down first and that's making the best use of your money, and then then start on the ones with the lower interest. Um, do you have any insight into that, Sheila? No, that's exactly right. It, it depends on their balances, of course. So say the say the high interest is um, their highest balance card. Well, then they wouldn't start on that. They would start on the lower ones. But that's essentially that is essentially what you should do. You should always work on your high uh, interest limits first. Yeah. And um, I know that uh, a lot of people still use, are using their credit cards. And what we tell them is don't use the ones with the high limits. Um, and I mean, the high interest, maybe get your lower, uh, your lower interest rate cards to give you a higher credit line. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there, there, there's different things and, and there's so much. And like you said, it's like almost like a one-on-one -on -one um, you have to talk to everybody has a different situation. Mm -hmm. And, and just one other thing on credit, once you get your credit, um, at least to, I would say 720, 700 and above, there are also zero interest credit cards that you can apply for online that are zero interest for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And you just pay it off within that period of time, and then you can keep rolling them over also. Those are some of the perks you have when you have good credit. You can look at that where you, you know, it, it benefits you. It saves you thousands of dollars depending on your balance. Absolutely, yeah. And um, what other services does, uh, does your company provide along these lines? It, it give some examples. I think, you know, everybody thinks, oh, I'm not going to qualify. They get scared because they don't have specifics. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Well, here's the first step we do. And I, I like to line it out. So whenever I meet with the client in the office, the realtor brings them in and I meet with them. I give them a, an outline, I give them step one, step two, step three. Uh, sometimes there's more steps, but the general steps are we review the credit. We review everything. Um, say after the initial meeting, I've looked at everything, application is submitted, look at the credit. Step one would be working on the credit, assuming that we needed to uh, work on the credit and help them. Um, they're referred over to the credit services team, Adalia, Ava, and, and the rest of the team over there who are awesome, they're very caring individuals, very smart. They come from a credit background. Um, they are our, our employees. They are not a a third party, so they are part of Nova, and um, they analyze their credit. They actually look at it. They do put it through a credit analyzer, and they look at it to see, and they look at different options. Depending on the score that I let them know what we need for the program that the person wants to qualify for, so would it be different for somebody qualifying for a down payment assistance versus a conventional loan, yeah. different rates, uh, different um, uh, middle credit score is required. So step one is uh, working with the credit, uh, the credit expert. Um, the the action plan that is provided, following it, interacting with us, and uh, asking questions as we go along. 
we will follow up with them. And um, three times uh, without an answer, they we have so many people we help, we just have to let them know, you know, we need you to engage or else um, we have to not help you anymore until you're ready. So that's step one, working on the credit. The next step is once they're ready with the credit, they provide their documentation. They're given a list, all uh, prospects and borrowers are given a list of what's needed. And it's really pretty simple. Everything is back to basics right now for qualifying. Um, it's uh, the most recent four pay stubs on average. It's an overlapping 30 day pay stub history that's needed. Two month bank statements, uh, W-2s for two years, uh, that's for a W-2 employee. And if you're self-employed, that you need two years tax returns, your personal and business tax returns with your 1099s, K-1s, and or W-2s, and if they're applicable. And uh, then we look at that and we analyze it and see where you're at, come up with where you're at. And then step three is where you're actually going out there and you're shopping for your home. So yeah, and moving forward to purchasing. So would you say then it's an average of three to four months to, uh, to is that kind of the average to get people's credit to where they can purchase? I would say that is a good average, Ruth. Yes, because there are some people, depending on uh, the, the score we want, that could take up to 11 months. And some of them are as little as one or two months. So, yes, let's use let's use four months as an average. Mm -hmm. So if and it goes by so fast. I know. <laughs> Believe me. If, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I always say the days are long and the years are short. So mm -hmm. um, if they started like now, you know, they could get, they could be in a home by summertime. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's really it's really important if if that is something you've always wanted to do but never thought you could, reach out because we can help you make your dream come true. Super, yeah. super. And you have another, um, you want to go on to the last slide here? Yeah, let's go to the last slide. So the last slide is there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And this ties into what I was just talking about. Uh, if you think or if you thought you could never purchase, you absolutely can. These are the current wait times um, per Fannie Mae, uh, FHA, VA, and USDA Rural. So <clears throat> if you've had a foreclosure, a short sell, a Chapter 7 or Chapter 13 bankruptcy, these are the different uh, wait times to purchase, to apply for a home loan um, for those different type of uh, uh, lender loans. So the foreclosure, basically on a Fannie Mae, it's seven years from the credit report date on a foreclosure or four years if included in the bankruptcy. So if included in the bankruptcy, it, it um, speeds up the time, the wait time. For a short sell, it's uh, four years from the completion date. Chapter seven bankruptcy, four years from discharge or dismissal. And chapter 13, two years from discharge or four years from dismissal. Now the, the dates, uh, the completion dates, basically the time frame that the property has changed into the other person's name for a foreclosure or short sale. And then on a bankruptcy from a discharge uh, from when it was actually discharged with the courts or dismissed if it was not gone through. Sometimes you can file a bankruptcy and not actually perfect it, not, not complete it. So that would be a dismissal date if you changed your mind on it per se. And if it, you went through with it, then that's the discharge date when it was discharged. The, the, the loan type that I love the best is FHA. It's got, excuse me, uh, VA. It's got the shortest time frame of them all. It's two years straight on down. Wow. Um, two years from the trustee sale. And there's a short sale. It used to be two years, but I see it's been updated. I had our marketing department update this. So no time frame as long as we get an automated underwriting system approval. So you have to have that. And then the chapter seven is two years and chapter 13 is one year um, out of the payout uh, must be, it must elapse and they should have a good payment history. Now the difference, let me explain real quick, the difference between a seven and a 13 bankruptcy in a nutshell, chapter seven, you're wiping, wiping the slate clean. Chapter 13, you're actually uh, on a payment plan. You're paying it back. That's basically the difference of the two. So, so, so so what you're saying uh, under the chapter 13. So if someone uh, reorganized, it, 
is that two years from when they completed their payment plan? Is that what discharge means? Yes, two years from when they completed their payment plan. Yes, and they got a discharge, recorded discharge from the courts. Cool. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know much about bankruptcy, but so chapter seven means that you're wiping your slate clean, but then you have to wait four years. Right. Now, uh, something else to add in that, if you wipe your slate clean, you have to be sure to reestablish credit. That's really, really important. Mm -hmm. If you wiped everything clean and you have no credit, there's nothing to, uh, there's nothing that Experian, TransUnion, or Equifax can base a credit score off of. So it's important to reestablish. So you, yeah. You know, uh, being in this business as long as we've been in, <laughs> uh, what I found in the past, people would be timid because they would be renters and we'd say, you know, why not buy a home? Well, you know, we had a bankruptcy and as a realtor in the beginning, back in the nineties, I didn't always know how to respond to that. So, you know, I think it's important when someone tells you that, um, that, you know, that, you know, these things, or you have this chart and you say, look, this can be the plan for you to get a home. You know, maybe it's because they think that once they've gone bankrupt, they can never buy a home. I think that's the worst. Right. And if you have the knowledge that you can articulate, you know, what's on this chart to those people, I think they would be amazed and impressed with you, number two, but also number three, they could buy a home and they could plan on it, uh, which uh, this is a great chart you put together because, you know, the fear of the unknown is the worst thing. And this mm -hmm. really would help people. If I, um, like, I know, Teresa, you do a lot of renters and Claudia, you do as well. And I would send this out to people, maybe with a little, um, you know, uh, front letter with it. But I would send it out to my renters and say, you know, um, a lot of people, I might send, I might send all three of these to someone, you know, to a renter because they're really good, Sheila. They're really, really they good. And these can be co-branded. Uh, they're definitely Claudia and Teresa and um, who else is on? Karen. They can be co-branded to you and you can send them to your um, your own clients. Yeah. With your information. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, also remember the cheat sheet. Some of you have my realtor cheat sheet. This is on that cheat sheet for you to keep. It's laminated. Yes. And you laminated can when people come to your yeah. class. Yeah. Information on there. Mm -hmm. Well, I know that this is, a, you know, financing is uh, normally the first step in the home purchase. I know we do have cash buyers, 20, 20 to 30 percent of people do pay cash nowadays, but you have the other uh, 80 to, to 70 percent that don't. And so this information to me is, is <clears throat> I, think, I think as a real estate agent, you need to know about lending. I know that we have to stay in our lane, but this is the first step. And if we can't articulate these things, then, um, you know, I think that uh, we don't come off as professional as uh, we really are. You know, I think because right. over the years, Sheila, I know we've always said, oh, you know, contact your lender first, then come see me. But if you can at least have an intelligent conversation about some of these lending ideas, I think that would really lend to people's professionalism. And I love the fact that you're giving classes and helping realtors understand the lending process. Right. It, it, it is really important. It, it is. Um, otherwise, you're going to be driving people around for days and you're going to and then they're going to be really disappointed and you're going to be disappointed because you didn't do your homework up front. This is kind of doing your homework up front. It's like when you uh, when you cook, you have a recipe, you know what goes into it. And with lending or uh, finding a home, taking somebody out, you want them to be sure, confident that they can purchase makes everything much more pleasant when they're with you you have the greatest job as a realtor you're a matchmaker right <laughs> i awesome. love that uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, we're the matchmakers that's true um the uh, the cost of waiting uh is a fantastic uh piece of information that you put together as well i'm going to put it back up here just because you know i really love that piece um to 
to get people moving quicker into uh, owning a home in the next two years when the rates are going to stay low. And it's uh, the cost of waiting is really important. I know um, we have cost of waiting uh, downloadable guides too on our website for people. And this is a great time to use them. So, um, Sheila, uh, do you have any parting words here today? Yeah, I have some residential loan trivia. Oh, we all oh. need that. We need that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I just thought some of these were good. Now, now the, the first ones, I'm going to go through a couple of uh, residential loan trivia and then finish it off with some fun things. Did you know um, home ownership trivia? So I, I found these. I thought they were really cool. Um, okay. Uh, now, these are pretty simple. Now, if you're, you're listening online, type your answer in if you know. So what, do you, what is the most common loan term for a residential loan? Do you guys know what that is? What is the most common loan term for a residential loan? I'll give you a hint. What is a residential loan called? <laughs> Come on, somebody, type it in. <laughs> Claudia, I know you know it. <laughs> it starts with an M. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Claudia. There she goes. There yeah. she goes. <laughs> oh, right. It's a mortgage. It's a mortgage. That's it. Just to, for the, just the, the, the sake of time, we'll keep it going. Okay. Um, what loan option may be the best for first time home buyers? FHA loans are excellent for first time home buyers because it's a lower down payment, lower interest rate in most cases, and less stringent credit. Oh. credit requirements so that's really good that so. that's that's is that on your uh cheat sheet uh no these are just things that i just came up with and i just yeah. you know it's just to share so yeah okay so um what are the three most common types of mortgages Claudia. Conventional, jumbo, and government insured mortgages. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I was thinking more specific, but yeah, those are the yeah. general. in general, those are the yeah, three most common types. And then the two most common type of um, rate types. Good job, Claudia. <laughs> uh, rate types are fixed rate mortgages and adjustable rate mortgages or arms. Those were very, very popular back before the 2008, 2007 crash. So we don't really see that many anymore, but we'll go into that, those particulars later. Um, something good to remember uh, before I get into a few fun things, the 2021 conventional and FHA loan limits have uh, increased. Yes. Conventional is now 548,250. It's up a little over 7% from 2020. Which was five, which is five ten four hundred right now until December thirty first. And how much will how much will it be? Five four eight two five zero. Oh. Well, you know that the beauty of that is that um, part of the reason why our mean average price of home has gone up this year is because there's been a lot of people uh, above five hundred thousand buying homes. Exactly. So, yeah, depending on how much they put down, that that's that's really good. And then FHA in Clark County is 362,250, and it's up 5% from 345 this year. 362,250. So 362? Uh huh. 362,250. Okay, now for a few fun things. Okay, in New York, why are homeowners required to disclose whether any ghosts inhabit or frequently visit their home? when they list it for sale. <laughs> they need to comply with the ghost busting ruling. <laughs> that was like crazy. I guess there's a lot of hauntings in New York. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> um, uh, oh, this is a good one. And uh, what is the most common street name in the United States? <laughs> 
What do you think, Ruth? Main Street. <laughs> second Street is in first place. Oh my. <laughs> Third Street is in second place. And oddly enough, First Street is in third place. Oh, that is really good trivia there. <laughs> that is different. Oh my gosh. And then the median size, what's the medium size home in the United States right now? That's a good one. I, I don't thought know. this was interesting. Yeah, approximately 2457 square feet, and it's 61% larger than 40 years ago. Oh, my. That so much for downsizing, right? It's, yeah, it's my like, goodness. Wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. And then um, a, a really good one that all of us strive to achieve. Historically, a red door has been a symbol of protection and refuge. However, in Scotland, it's significant. It's significant. Signif I can't say that. Signifies what? Don't know. <laughs> okay. It signif signifies that the home uh, owner has paid off the mortgage. Wow. Yeah. Now, I think in the United States, do you know what signifies that? The lion, the lion in the front of the house. Okay. The mortgage is paid off. Okay. Well, well that's, a little bit of trivia. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. 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 So that's our trivia for the, for this year. And yeah. Well, um, I'm going to put all of these flyers in the group so that, uh, you know, you, you can read the fine print and maybe study them a little bit and uh, learn more about lending and come to Sheila's class on January the 5th at nine o'clock, you said? 9 a.m. sharp. Um, Please be there because there's a class right after ours. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. And then on the 6th, let's see what I've got going on. Let's see here. Do, do, do. Go to B.Vegas. We have an ethics class coming up, our first class of the year called Show Me the Money. And this is one of my favorite classes. And it will be on Wednesday, January the 6th from 10 to 1. Um, there'll be free lunch. And um, it's at the Be Social Savvy Training Center at 8400 West Sahara. Please, uh, you can zoom in. Or if you want to come to the classroom, um, just uh, give us a, a shout back on the email that you receive and we'll make room for you. And uh, it's amazing, Sheila, at this time, how you have to wear a mask, but everybody wants to come to the classroom. <laughs> right. I think everybody has cabin fever. Yeah, they do, they do. They're so ready. <laughs> Sheila, thank you so much for all the support you give us all the time. And you're always there. You're so dependable, reliable. And um, I do my best to send people your way because you're really excellent at what you do. And uh, thank you so much for teaming up with me. I appreciate that. You're very welcome, Ruth. All righty. Well, I guess Happy New Year. Yeah. That's Happy New Year. I mean, next Saturday, it won't be 2021 or 2020 anymore. It'll be 2021. Am I right? You're right. I have to, yeah, it'll be the 2nd of January. Oh my goodness. We'll be two days into 2021 next Saturday. I will be here tomorrow morning. I have uh, uh, some nice things to share with you. Um, so see you tomorrow morning. And Sheila, we'll see you on Tuesday. I'll see you on Tuesday. The 5th. The 5th. <laughs> January 5th, exactly. Okay. okay, everybody. We love you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.